Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in our series, Growing the Critical Zone Research Network. This webinar is about dealing with change in the uh, critical zone. While everyone is logging on, uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Quasi website and YouTube channel following the presentation. There you can also find the previous webinar in this series, Modeling in the Critical Zone. We welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar and encourage you to ask them in the question and answer box below. Uh, our panelists will be able to leave some time for discussion at the end. Once again, thank you for tuning in to this third installment of the 2020 Quasi Winter Webinar Series, Growing the Critical Zone Research Network. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Pam, our host, uh, to introduce herself and the other panelists. afternoon slash morning slash middle of your night, depending on where you're at. Um, we're going to get started today with a topic I'm super excited about. I've enjoyed all of our panels so far, but this one's really thinking about ch changes that are taking place in the critical zone. And it's such a key component for us to be able to, to be able to measure these, to be able to analyze and to be able to maybe make some predictive models as well as time goes on. So again, all of our hosts welcome you. Just to remind you what the goal of these seminars is, is really to help, um, you know, move forward uh, critical zone con uh, concepts, but to make this open to everyone, to, to encourage um, uh, the participation of a greater population of undergraduates and graduates, uh, students, postdocs, and early career faculty. We really need the creative ideas that everyone has from multiple, dis di multiple disciplines to really help us to think about um, ways that we can solve these problems. So um, here, you know, just a reminder, uh, so we're all on the same page, what is critical zone science? It's stretching basically from the top of the canopy down to the depths of circulating groundwater, and it requires um, us thinking about the integration and interaction of the earth in an environmental science and atmospheric science and how that occurs across from the atmosphere down to the bedrock. Again, it requires multiple disciplines and it really create, requires diverse thoughts and skill sets needed. So right now we're, we're trying to help to promote this uh, critical zone approach in the system, trying to bring folks together and diversify the critical zone community. That's really where our goal is in these cyber seminar series, as well as the workshops and future um, uh, programs that we'll be developing over the next five years. So just to remind you, we're gonna have our meeting June 22nd through 25th at the Colorado School of Mines. There's no registration fees for this. We're covering housing, travel. We can support up to 80 folks coming. So we really encourage you to apply. Um, please apply uh, by April 1st, and you can go to these Google sites, the Google site that we have here. In addition to that, I just want to also point out that there's another research coordination network that's taking place for critical zone research, but focused on carbonate systems. Also having a workshop this summer, August 2nd through 5th. So you can go to this website to get a little bit more information on that one as well. So super exciting today, we have a panel um, uh, that's coming to us uh, from eco-hydrologists to geomorphologists ecosystems, um, ecologists, pedologists, biogeochemists, and geophysicists. So we're gonna go ahead and get started today. I'm gonna facilitate, and, um, and with, along with Nicole West uh, over at uh, University of Central Michigan, and um, hopefully we'll have a nice time. So first up, I'll introduce Holly ba uh, Barnard. <laughs> Barnard. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be part of my first uh, cyber seminar, and I hope that um, we can have some great questions and interactions. Thinking about change in the critical zone. So um, I lead an eco-hydrology group at the University of Colorado, where we're really focused on carbon and water interactions in the critical zone. So we think about these from two really, um, you know, interdisciplinary perspectives, thinking about from an ecological perspective, and then also from a hydrological perspective. So thinking about things as um, small as leaf level physiology and as large as watershed scale processes. So when we think about change in the critical zone, we can think about our very fundamental ecological model of change and resilience. 
or disturbance in resilience. So in our upper panel here, we have our original state factor down in our little depression. And then we can think about our ecological state in terms of its um, ability to um, respond or be resilient to change um, or um, uh, its inability to recover from change. So when I talk to my students about this in our introductory class, I say, think of yourself if you've ever had the pleasure of playing bubble ball or bumper soccer, then you know, think of yourself as that little ball on the state, uh, in the state factor in your original state. So you're playing bubble ball and along comes another individual. And so depending on your skills, um, your position at the time, then you're going to be more, more or less likely to be able to recover back to being on your feet. So when we look at our lower panel, we can think about um, uh, the ecosystem or the eco-hydrologic system. And depending on its state factors, it's going to have more or less likelihood to be able to recover to its original state. So when we're faced with climate change or hydrologic change, or you know, as a factor of climate change, then we have the potential for our ecological state to end up like this. Um, and so whether we stay in this state or not depends on um, a number of factors. So in my group, when we think about change, then we also begin to start thinking about the spatial signatures of resilience. So thinking about our landscapes, we can begin to think about what areas on the landscape are gonna be more or less likely to be sensitive to change or gonna end up in that upside down bubble ball state rather than back on its feet. So one example of thinking about the spatial sensitivity to change is just looking at the distribution of carbon, above ground carbon on the landscape. So these are two catchments from the Boulder Creek CZO. So um, on the right is Gordon Gulch, which is an upper montane catchment. And on the left is the uh, Como Creek catchment, which is just below the Niwot Ridge LTR site, if anyone's familiar with that. So um, what we have here is you look at the different colors, red is higher, blue is lower, in terms of how carbon, above ground carbon, is distributed on the landscape. And you can see in Gordon Gulch, we have really strong spatial patterns that are related to the drainages or the drainage network, where we have the greatest amount of carbon located um, in, our drain in our drainages. Where in our upper elevation site, the, the spatial patterns are more distributed or more diffuse. So when we think about change on the landscape, when we think about temperature change, we think about hydrologic change, then we can begin to think about, all right, if we have uh, what areas on the landscape are gonna be most sensitive. So is it gonna be south facing slopes with higher radiation, greater evapotranspiration? Are our drainage areas gonna um, result in micro refugia for these uh, ecosystems? So, but we can go beyond just thinking about the above ground, the, the CZ science, the critical zone science is really thinking about the integration between the above ground and the below ground. And some of the things that I'm most excited about are thinking about these interactions between hydrologic flow paths and how that affects both the above ground carbon and the below ground carbon and weathering processes. So here we just have a schematic of, on the left we have some of the different state factors that can differ um, spatially in terms of lithology, regolith dip, uh, depth, uh, porosity, the permeability, and then also what type of vegetation is there. And all of those things come together to think about how the critical zone functions. So how water is going to infiltrate and get redistributed through the landscape, and then in turn, how that's going to affect the carbon processes. So not only the above ground carbon or forest growth as demonstrated in the panel above, but also the below ground carbon. How is it going to affect the amount of uh, carbon that comes from root exudates. How are those root exudates going to promote weathering in the subsurface? And then how is that weathering gonna uh, feed back on the environment to change the way water flows? So ultimately, um, we're really interested in understanding the interactions between spatial distributions or spatial vari variation and how water is stored and moved in, the, moved in the subsurface, and then how that affects both the bi-directional processes in the above ground and below ground within the critical zone. And understanding how that is going to uh, influence the heterogeneity of change or what areas are most resilient or sensitive on the landscape. And ultimately, we wanna do this in a very um, inclusive and educational uh, manner where we are including uh, populations from K through 12 with um, outreach locally and broadly 
and then also engaging all the way through to um, uh, the higher education um, college level through postdocs, uh, collaborations with other professors, graduate students. So if you're still interested, then um, right now, because of that, the, the CZ is, uh, is the critical zone science is currently in transition with a new solicitation and new awards coming out. I've focused on opportunities um, for you to interact with folks in at CU Boulder and the surrounding community. For undergraduates, um, there's multiple undergraduate summer intern programs, the SMART program, um, summer multicultural access to research training program, um, research experience for community college community college students. Um, the RESIS program operated by UNAVCO located in Boulder is a wonderful program. And the SOARS program operated by uh, INCAR also located in Boulder is also a wonderful program. I have served as a, a science and writing and coach for um, all of these programs. And I, and I continue to be involved as well as my collaborators and students. Um, for postdocs and graduate students, um, you know, Hopefully with uh, the new CZ solicitation, there'll be new funding opportunities and new educational opportunities. But beyond that, if you're interested, um, I'm always happy to collaborate with someone in developing a proposal. Um, if you are faculty or postdoc or graduate student, come visit. If you can take a semester, um, come visit the lab. We can build collaborations. Um, there's some uh, travel grant opportunities. One of those uh, great ones is the Kwasi Pathfinder grant. Um, and then just keep an eye out for future opportunities with the development of the new Critical Zone Network. Thanks so much, Holly. And so while we're transitioning, I'll welcome Francis Rengers uh, from the USGS. Excited to hear what you have to, to show us. All right, hi everyone, thanks for having me. So the main thing that I, I think is really interesting and in what I study um, about the effects on the Critical Zone for wildfire um, are debris flows like you can see in the photo um, on the left of the screen. And so these debris flows are really interesting critical zone processes because um, they, the soil and, and vegetation when that's burned and um, altered from the fire, it creates a lot of enhanced runoff. That, that enhanced runoff can scour channels like you can see with this arrow um, it scours channels down to bedrock in a lot of uh, really rocky mountainous areas um, and transports a lot of sediment um, downstream. And so you can see this person for scale, all these uh, huge boulders were moved um, after a fire. And that's pretty typical. Um, so we can then use uh, modeling or, or mapping um, to kind of show why this happens or, or where this happens. And so, um, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm showing here that we have a watershed and there was a lot of erosion on the profile and the, the red areas show, um, the red dots show where there's erosion and the blue dots show where there's deposition. Um, so, you know, the, the change that happens um, after wildfires is, uh, is really interesting. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's a devastating um, process for um, infrastructure and for human life. So that's why I study it. And there's definitely uh, a lot of different ways to get involved um, and to, you know, come work at the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, so there are internships for um, graduate students. There's the GRIP internship and the, the intern, it's literally called that, the intern internship. Um, there's also uh, for our Science Center where I work um, every year we have a job fair and then we post all those jobs at uh, usajobs.gov and that's around February so um, everybody feel free to apply and get into that and, and the USGS also has the Mindenhall postdoctoral program um, which is a great way to um, do a postdoc with the USGS. Um, for undergraduates there's the USGS uh, NAGT cooperative field training program um, that's for undergrads who do well in their field camps, and they get recommended um, into a pool of folks that can then um, come into the USGS to work for a summer or maybe a little bit more. Um, there's a recess program at UNAFCO that Holly mentioned. Um, I've also worked with that. and It's just a fantastic way um, to get involved. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, I think that wildfire is a really interesting part of the uh, critical zone that uh, deserves a lot more study. Thanks so much. I think that's super interesting just to see how much, uh, uh, how much of the landscape can change so quickly as a result of fire. So next up, we have Sharon Billings, who will be talking to maybe about how it influences the subsurface, maybe not fire. <laughs> no fire. Um, but so I am a biogeoscientist at the University of Kansas. Sometimes I refer to myself as an ecosystem ecologist. And there are quite a few critical zone scientists and ecosystem ecologists who are very excited about the, the critical zone paradigm because the definition of ecosystem ecology is the study of the interaction of the abiotic world with the biotic world. And so um, the critical zone paradigm, the CZ idea of where life meets rock really um, does a wonderful job of addressing that. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit about what I do to be looking at uh, and investigating change in the critical zone. So we work at several different scales. And at the microcosm scale, we are very interested in understanding the influence of enzymes represented by this little orange um, diamond arrow here um, as it catalyzes the decay of organic matter in soil. So that is essentially releasing organically bound nutrients. And we also look at the influence of acids, especially um, carbonic acid and organic acids produced by biota as those acids work um, towards dissolution of minerals and the release of mineral bound nutrients as a result. We work at, at larger scales um, thinking about the influence of fe ecosystem features like temperature regime and pH on these processes at the microcosm. And we think about how they ultimately result in the um, response of biota. So for example, we're very interested in how um, root abundances change with depth as you move around the planet. So this is an example plot um, put together by my graduate student, Emma Hauser, looking at the changes in rooting abundances with depth as we move from old growth reference forests into regenerating forests. And we can create data like this all over the world in different ecosystems, trying to understand how biota are probing the, the critical zone subsurface in an attempt to acquire nutrients and water. And we also are interested at the mesocosm and plot scale in thinking about how biota influence for example, the um, percent soil organic carbon and how land use changes can actually drive a decline, especially in the surface soil organic carbons. So this is tapping into some of the, um, the kinds of information that uh, Holly Barnard also is, was looking at a few minutes ago. And this, the sometimes surprising and counterintuitive change in the persistence of carbon down deep. So as, as deep as two meters, we see changes associated with land use change in the radiocarbon signature. So this is all with an eye towards trying to understand change in the critical zone induced by climate. So thinking about temperature regime and how these very small scale processes are changing and changes in land use and how that's um, interacting with climate to influence carbon storage in systems and nutrient uptake of roots from, from depth. And at much broader scales, we're interested in regional and bios biosphere um, phenomena. So one example here is trying to understand how rooting abundances change and rooting depth distributions change in the Anthropocene at a biosphere scale. And at a regional scale, we can use remote sensing indices to understand um, how different ecosystems, so here I have watersheds and hill slope remote sensing images from Landsat, looking at productivity across those regions, trying to understand how water availability and nutrient availability can influence ecosystem productivity. And a big point that I wanted to make here is, is that as we move across these scales, there are feedbacks and questions that we can ask about those feedbacks. So we can take material or information generated at the very small scale 
and think about how that has big scale imp impacts. So an example of this is um, work that my graduate student um, Ligia Sousa has focused on looking at the release of organically bound nutrients. She's specifically looking at phosphatase and she's starting to think about that at a global scale. So here we have this double ended arrow representing feedbacks between Micro, fundamental information unearthed at the microcosm scale and thinking about it at the large scale. So Ligia has pulled together maps of phosphorus content and associated, not shown here, but maps of pH, trying to understand how temperature and pH regime in a soil um, can influence those very small scale enzymatic processes, ultimately to influence nutrient availability for an ecosystem. So I put together these um, examples from um, students in my lab trying to understand how very small scale features can scale up to very large scale phenomena and um, vice versa, how observations at a large scale, we can take those observations and um, come up with some really clever lab scale experiments to try to understand the mechanisms driving those really large scale observations. So those are my examples of explorations of change in the critical zone. And I also wanted to um, share a slide showing some different ways to get involved. So I've really focused on how we can look for data. So one thing we are not shy of is data. Um, there's a lot of data that's out there. And so, for example, um, the Critical Zone Exploration Network is a really valuable website for lots of reasons, but one thing that I love it for is that you can search for an ecosystem of interest using your criteria of interest. So for example, you can search for a system by precipitation regime, or let's say you're only interested in mollusols or ultrasols or spotosols. You can search for hydrologic characteristics. Whatever your critical zone question of interest is, you can find places to address it. And I really want to emphasize the openness of our community of critical zone investigators. Not every critical zone investigator actually works at a CZO. There are many investigators who use the critical zone paradigm every day who are working in their systems of interest that are not formal CZOs. I also want to emphasize the availability of these amazing websites like um, re3data.org. This is a website where you can search for data repositories. So you can enter keywords of interest and find data repositories like EDI as one example, the environmentaldatainitiative.org. They have a data portal where you can both upload data, but also you can use it as a resource, again, using keywords. And you can use tools as simple as Microsoft Excel as a, as a beginning tool just to try to understand if, if an idea that you have has traction across a large number of, of data sites that meet your criteria of interest. I also want to put a plug in out a plug out for Google Earth Engine. This is a this is a wonderful um, way of exploring the whole biosphere or just looking for downscaled data for your region of interest that looks at um, an incredible array of environmental phenomena. And in, on many other websites, you can find code to analyze Google Earth Engine data to, again, to see if an idea that you might have has traction. And finally, I want to emphasize the availability of data through the NSF's LTER network and also through NSF's NEON. And just as an example of um, ways you can access these data on February 27th, there's a, another webinar on how to access and work with NEON data. And this webinar is advertised as something you can go to. They will walk you through how to access NEON data, how to pull it into R and how to do um, and some basic R commands. So there's, there are some wonderful resources out there for how to access data and, and ultimately how, um, how to share your data. So I think that's really important as we look for global scale phenomena or maybe just soil order scale phenomena and as we try to understand the mechanisms driving those phenomena that we might see. Thank you, Sharon. That was um, very interesting. Um, I'm all very excited about the, the NEON webinar now, so thanks for sharing that uh, information. Um, in keeping with uh, carbon in soils across scales and perhaps across solar systems, our next speaker is going to be Rebecca Librand from Oregon State University. 
Uh, hello, my name is Rebecca Librand. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Crop and Soil Science at Oregon State University. And I am a pedologist, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that I am a soil scientist who gets to go outside and dig soil pits and think about interactions among biological, physical, and chemical agents uh, that contribute to the formation of soil and uh, to the evolution of our uh, critical zone here on Earth. Uh, the project that I wanted to highlight today uh, with respect to thinking about change across different types of climates uh, involves the deployment of these small mesh bags. And to think about this, I would like you to envision yourself in a coastal rainforest in Southeast Alaska or sitting in the desert, um, deserts of Southern Arizona, for example, and picturing the soil as something that is not just a pile of jumbled rock and minerals or decaying plant roots. I would like you to picture it as something that's alive. And there's fungi and bacteria and all of these different living agents uh, that are interacting with mineral grains to release nutrients for uptake by plants and to support our terrestrial ecosystems. And what our team has done is taken these mesh bags filled with different types of ground rock uh, that contain different types of nutrients, potassium, calcium, other types of nutrients that are of interest to microbes and plants. And we bury these in the surface soil uh, from one up to three years uh, so far. And after three years of study, we went and retrieved these bags and through a collaboration with the Pacific Northwest National Lab, we've been analyzing these samples using high resolution microscopy, as well as uh, mass spectrometry to be able to understand the organic inputs that have moved into the bags. And so I would like you to picture um, analyzing individual sand grains. Uh, when these are projected underneath the microscope, uh, the images you get are literally the size of your computer screen in terms of being able to look at the details of how fungi and bacteria are interacting with the mineral grains after only a few years out in the critical zone. And our study has documented evidence of fungi growing through surface sheets of minerals, um, as well as different types of weathering um, from a more chemical weathering type of standpoint. Uh, so this has been a really exciting type of project uh, to work on across these different climates. And the other thing that I wanted to emphasize today is that uh, the critical zone community is not the only one interested in thinking about uh, mineralogy and mineral weathering. Uh, NASA is also very in interested in this field of study. And there's even talk about uh, extending our scope of thinking about the critical zone to thinking about the critical zone on Mars, for example. Uh, so that's something that I just wanted to uh, leave you with in terms of thinking across scales and across disciplines and even across uh, different types of planets, potentially. With respect in, to getting involved, if you need more soil in your life or more critical zone science, and who doesn't really, uh, there are lots of different ways that you can become more educated on soil and critical zone science. Uh, the first I would encourage you to look into, if these topics are new for you, are different types of online courses that are available, uh, whether that be soil specific or critical zone courses that are also available online. Uh, through Oregon State, for example, uh, we actually have a full online soils degree program now. So there are lots of opportunities to get involved in that way. Uh, many of us, as several of the panelists have referred to, love getting out in the field and showing people our sites and our science. And so if this is something that's of interest to you, I would definitely encourage looking around at your area. That Critical Zone Exploration Network would be a great place to start. And just look for scientists working in your area and reach out to them, uh, maybe with different government agencies or universities or research institutions. Uh, the third thing is to think about different ways of um, soil education or critical zone education. I know for myself, I've worked with a lot of K through 12 teachers on developing programming uh, related to looking at soil texture, building your own critical zone activities uh, for students, as well as this intersection between science and art with soil painting. And with respect to undergraduate and graduate research opportunities, um, I always encourage students, especially graduate students, to reach out well in advance if they're interested in working with my team uh, so we can think about different potential pathways for funding. And it's always fantastic to have undergraduate students join us, even from different disciplines. And just one example of this, um, even with the students outside of Oregon State, uh, we are sometimes able to line up different ways to fund students to come out uh, to do research. This is a student, an undergraduate student from last summer who joined us in Alaska. We were actually able to line up some funding to support his research uh, through his home institution. 
And then finally, um, online digital video resources are another excellent way to get involved and to learn more about uh, the soils as well as the critical zone communities, thinking about what's available on Twitter or YouTube. And if you're interested in learning more about the work that I've done um, in Arizona at the Catalina Critical Zone Observatory, I had the opportunity to create a GoPro video titled Soil Not Dirt uh, through a science communication fellowship. And that is just to bring even more exciting um, perspectives to the world of soil. And so if you have any questions about how to get involved or anything that I've referenced today, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I think that it's very exciting to think about critical zones on other planets. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that, um, bringing that line of thinking into your presentation. Um, kind of continuing on, um, we are doing great on time. So thank you so much to all the presenters for um, staying very concise, but beautifully thorough. Um, our next speaker now is Julia Perdriel from University of Vermont. All right, thanks for having me. Um, and I love that Rebecca mentioned soil art because I just wanted to start with some art here. And um, that's uh, on the left-hand side, that's a piece of art from Victor Vezzarelli that I like a lot. And uh, all that is is uh, white stripes on a black background, but it's this really dynamic picture of zebras and that's its name. And on the right-hand side is another piece of art, which is by Ursus Verli, which is a Swiss artist, and he takes it upon himself to clean up art, um, which I find very charming because it's such a Swiss idea to try. <laughs> but um, so essentially he takes all of these stripes and stacks them by size and by shape and makes a new thing. Um, but I think we could argue that the meaning of the original piece of art gets lost in the process. So as we have these beautiful stacks of stripes, um, if we would only see this, we would never know that this once was a part of a zebra or two, two zebras. And so it seems sort of silly to do, but essentially what we're doing in disciplinary research is sort of the same. We have plant stuff, soil stuff, rock stuff, water stuff. And if we don't do critical zone research, we might just keep those separate stacks. Um, but that's the part that I love about critical zone research, because we all know that we need this type of transdisciplinary approach to really make sense and give meaning um, to our findings. So to my own research, um, the theme this week is changes in the critical zone. And uh, we've heard a couple of um, presenters already mention scale and really focusing on scale. And this is also my favorite thing right now. So the scale of change in the critical zone, and I give an example. So I'm in Vermont. Um, one of my favorite places to work is the Sleepers River Research Watershed. Um, that's in northeastern Vermont. And um, you can see it's in the northeast, and then there is a nested system, a watershed, and then in that watershed, there's a sub-watershed. So we're kind of going from a scale of hundreds of kilometers to maybe a kilometer or so. We can sample, we can take water stuff. And in that specific example, a lot of what I do it revolves around carbon. So what we looked at is dissolved organic carbon and changes in that over the past couple of decades. And that plot shows that the flux of carbon over the past 25 years or so increased significantly in that watershed. Um, and then looking a little bit closer at soil stuff to kind of try and add a process to that pattern, one piece that came out of that research is that, well, that might be a lot of small stuff in soils that actually might drive or might be responsible for that increase of dissolved organic carbon that's coming out of this watershed. But the driver might be something continental, okay? Um, climate change, for example, or other drivers, um, land use change, changes in precipitation composition. That is something that is active at a scale so much larger. So now we're talking thousands of kilometers or even global scales. So how can we you know, make sense out of this? This is obviously, that's me trying to kind of show that there is a scale mismatch. How can we put together 
processes at the micron scale and drivers at the continental scale and make sense out of this. So my favorite thing right now is to work with people that can handle big data. Um, so this is a project that we have active combining complex systems tools, process-based modeling and experiments to bridge scales and low temperature geochemistry. And um, on the team is Donna Rizzo, Lili and Adrian Harpold, and a bunch of amazing students and postdocs. And in this project, we use the regional to continental scale um, to extract patterns, to kind of find what is, what is kind of happening just on the pattern part. So I would say, coming back to the zebras, we just kind of get this blurry idea of what that picture might look like. But then we add on detailed observations on what we find, you know, what could be hypothesized processes. And we add up more information maybe on those single stacks. And putting this all together using process-based modeling, such as reactive transport modeling at the catchment scale, we might then just get that zebra picture back. So for getting involved, um, I think a lot of this has already been said, but I can't stress this enough. Season is amazing. Just sign up for it. It's really easy. Um, also, shameless pitch to collaborate with us. Um, so um, Sharon mentioned all these data sources that you can look at, and we'll add one more. Um, we'll soon publish a data set um, that's adding chemistry to an existing data set that already is there, CAMEL. So that's catchment attributes and meteorolo meteorology for um, large sample studies. I might have just butchered this. Um, Gary Sterling and Adrian Harpold curate this and we'll be rolling it out really soon. Also, please don't be shy. Uh, come up to us and talk to us at conferences. I'll be at Goldschmidt and I'll be at um, ESA this year. Um, you could also just shoot me an email and we arrange a meeting. I always love talking to people. Um, and then we also mentioned the new um, Critical Zone Network this year also. So I always want to quote Michelle Obama. Um, she says, don't be afraid to ask for help. Nobody gets, gets through college on their own, but I would say nobody gets through research on your own. So ask for help. Thank you, Julia. Um, and that is exactly why we have put this set of webinars together. And our meeting in June is we are trying to help each other um, develop and answer the next uh, generation of critical zone questions. Um, so, and it is certainly a transdisciplinary science and we need as many new um, brains and ideas as possible. So thank you for that. So we're gonna uh, finish up with Xavi Comas at Florida Atlantic University and he might be the, um, the only geophysicist on the panel today, um, but he will be talking about um, that perspective of understanding change. So take it away, Xavi, thank you. Hi, thank you. Well, I feel like a lot of responsibility now. <laughs> so uh, let me see if this works. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, keeping on the theme of uh, understanding change in the critical zone, um, uh, like Nicole said, I'm, uh, I'm a geophysicist. I do near surface geophysics. Now I know that looks like a zebra there, uh, but it's actually a GPR profile. <laughs> so um, just very briefly for those unfamiliar with near surface geophysics, uh, we, we use different methods to target uh, specific contrast in uh, physical properties. Depending on the method you're using, you are targeting a different physical property. In this case, we're uh, looking at changes in relative dielectric permittivity. So then what we do is, <clears throat> uh, based on the, those contrasts, we apply uh, some petrophysical model to then infer a variable that we might be interested in. Uh, in this case, maybe might be moisture content, porosity, uh, or you know, depending on the method, might vary, obviously depending on the petrophysical model. Just to show you a quick example then of how based on that we measure change, uh, the classic way uh, will be using time-lapse data. Um, so you'll repeat the same measurement over time. Uh, just obviously, we're, I'm in Florida, so I have to show some part of the Everglades somehow. So this is just a profile on the Everglades uh, that's looking time-lapse, uh, using time-lapse data to 
look at how, instead of moisture content, how actually gas content is changing uh, within the subsurface, uh, within these speed soils that we have in the Everglades. Um, and then, um, again, we're not getting into the details, but you can see for three different moments in time, uh, you can see, uh, you know, uh, lateral variability in gas content. So then you can see, you know, moving from uh, March 22nd to April 18, you can see like gas content building up and then moving into uh, uh, June 20, you can see really uh, changes in uh, decreases in the gas content that we can infer as, as releases. So that's the classic way to uh, measure time um, and measure change basically by using time-lapse data. Um, now in the critical zone uh, per se, uh, we're uh, interested in uh, critical zone architecture and landscape evolution. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at is uh, uh, nick, point, nick point migration. Um, so again, we're not getting too much into the details, but uh, a nick point essentially is a, is a sharp change in, in a river profile um, that basically is telling you how uh, the river migrates when the uh, base level changes, right? So if the base level changes, then the river responds by basically carving uh, into that landscape. So uh, when you have this profile, this overall profile of your, you know, um, river profile, um, different positioning along that profile is basically telling you uh, different moments in time of how that river has evolved, right? And how the landscape has changed. So um, that's what we use, or that's the basis for, again, like, um, oops, sorry. Um, instead of using time-lapse data then, since obviously, you know, that will not work, uh, trying to repeat measurements and see, you know, landscape changing at this kind of uh, temporal scales, then we, we use what we call, uh, or what it's called space for time substitutions, and that's been used for decades. Uh, a lot of, you know, mainly ecology and geomorphology um, but essentially, you're, we're assuming that uh, spatial and time variation basically are equivalent. So then by looking again at how different um, positioning along that landscape is changing, then we can infer how, you know, that temporal change has been. Um, so then based on that, uh, we, again, that's uh, some of the work we've been doing in, uh, in this case, it's at the Rukiyo Critical Zone Observatory. Uh, we have a very sharp uh, nick point boundary and then we've been uh, essentially applying geophysics uh, at different scales using different methods again this is kind of a bit dense but the idea is that you know one of i feel like the interesting things about geophysics is the ability to uh, collect this multi-scale uh, multi-methods again this is showing kind of a bit of a mixture of electrical resistivity and terrain conductivity even airborne surveys so you can kind of capture this like spatial variability, uh, you know, at different uh, scales of measurement. Um, anyway, that's basically for uh, kind of my interest in, in uh, you know, um, critical zone. Uh, for the second part, how we get involved or how to get involved in the critical zone science. Again, this, a lot of this is probably repeats already. Uh, you know, I think it's pretty much all covered. Uh, just to mention, you know, um, a lot of you are basically getting into your degrees or have the way in your degrees. You're like, um, you know, taking classes. I don't know, one thing I can, you know, from my kind of uh, perspective from a near surface geophysicist is maybe try to think about versatility and applicability uh, as you, you know, learn about some of these methods that you're learning. Uh, that it's obviously going to be very helpful in, you know, uh, critical zone science or anything that implies a lot of like, you know, multidisciplinary studies, uh, being able to apply methods that, you know, um, that you can apply in a different, uh, you know, uh, settings and, and different scales of measurement and things like that. Um, so again, you know, that's something to consider, you know. Uh, now to get more into, uh, you know, again, some of the repeats um, that probably you guys uh, we've already heard today, but uh, there is like many different options for students and early career uh, scientists, both nationally and internationally. Um, you know, one thing is even conferences. Uh, I'm very involved with AGU and the fall meeting, but you know, this applies to other conferences, uh, GSA or you know, many other. Uh, but even like you know, just taking 
2019 for the fall meeting, uh, I mean, you know, the amount of like critical control science is just growing exponentially every year. I mean, this year we had like more than 400 sessions mainly related to critical zone. There were like town halls, uh, even workshops, several workshops. There was one very interesting uh, uh, on uh, uh, international critical zone network. So again, you know, like as you go to conferences, you know, explore, uh, you know, ways to get more involved with critical zone because it's, you know, there and there is like so many. Uh, other things that it's like even you can find courses like especially geared towards like students and early career people. Uh, there's been a couple of years also, uh, this like very nice like summer school in Italy uh, that it also focused on, uh, focusing on uh, critical zone. Um, even we heard today like there is many other networks also organizing a lot of different things, LTR, even uh, internationally, uh, Oscar, the, the, the French Critical Zone Network, uh, even dedicated workshops, uh, like Pam was saying, you know, uh, Colorado School of Mines, June of this year, that, you know, these are all great opportunities for those, you know, interested in getting involved in Critical Zone, especially, you know, uh, if you're a student in an early career. Um, and then just to, you know, uh, mention as well, we already heard, but uh, obviously there is a, new opportunities coming soon uh probably you know uh, i guess the future is a little uncertain <laughs> uh in terms of you know uh, there was a new program solicitation the critical zone collaboration network and uh, it seems like probably things are going to be changing a little bit from what we've known so far with all these critical zone observatories but there's definitely a lot of new things going to be opening and you know something uh to keep an eye on that uh, that's basically it. Thank you. Thanks, Travi. So um, now that our panelists are done, we can open it up for questions. Um, a, a couple have started trickling in and I wanna be um, mindful of schedules. I know that Holly and Julia both need to run to teach class. So I wanna open up the, the first question to you first in the, it, the last couple of minutes that you have to share, but um, the question that is coming in is, I'll direct this at Holly, what, um, what changes have you already started to see that you think um, going across disciplines and maybe working with geophysicists um, uh, and other interdisciplinary scientists um, can, help you, can help you understand better? Sure, and uh, just to clarify, I don't have to go to class. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, I just can't tell time. Um, so, uh, it, you know, some of the changes like preliminary, pre preliminarily um, working with geophysicists, um, in particular, Kamini Singha, is um, we began to look at um, in the subsurface how the um, sub -su subsurface topography um, might be feeding back in terms of either um, where we have a greater density of trees, so again, a greater accumulation of biomass on the landscape, or where we see those trees um, be, being able to uh, evapotranspire and photosynthesize at a higher rate for a more prolonged period of time. So, so uh, essentially just differences in very localized uh, water storage and it feeding back to the forest ecosystem. And we're using um, the electrical resistivity imaging um, to get an idea of what that heterogeneity in the subsurface storage is on the you know ten meter to tens of meter scale to the hill slope, at the plot to hill slope scale. Very cool. Do any of the other panelists um, have interest? Uh, Want to contribute? an answer to that question, because we're starting to get more coming in, so we can move on to. Julia, did you have an idea? I always think of, of the research you're doing has a lot to do with these changes. Yeah, um, well, I, I just think it's the, it's the most fun if you get to play with other people that know things that you don't know and suddenly things become so much clearer. So there's a research that we completed um, already a couple of years ago from the Arizona CZO and New Mexico CZO 
where we closed the catchment scale carbon balance, um, which was one of those undertakings where you have data sets from all sorts of areas in the catchment and you need people that know about biomass and soil carbon and streams and groundwater and all of these. And what came out of this was, for example, that not only the amount of water delivery mattered because these are close to water limitation in, in this um, system, but also the timing mattered so much. And just this kind of offset when water is there versus when plants need it mattered so much on what go, goes on in the entire critical zone. And that was really interesting. Um, after the fact, you could say, Duh, of course, water matters. But um, putting those pieces together um, is only possible in such an interdisciplinary team, for sure. Also having the tools, right? The remote sensing tools, the feet on the ground tools, the like all of these tools together makes it really, really cool. Thanks, Julia. So there's a question coming in that I would really like to get Sharon's perspective on. And that is um, one of our participants is interested in knowing um, how as you're going across scale um, and the differences in processes in scale when you're trying to extrapolate from one scale to another, um, how do you manage uncertainty and propagate uncertainty from one um, set of conceptual models to another? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I see that question in the Q&A too, and I, I can't, I'm probably not the best person to respond specifically about critical zone models, um, like theory models. Um, but conceptually, it's a really interesting question because, for example, if um, as Ligia Sousa, a PhD candidate in my lab, has demonstrated, there's a really strong dependence on um, temperature and pH for the rate at which organically bound phosphorus is released to bioavailable forms for microbes or roots. Um, if we see that in the lab in a very biochemical kind of way, right, there, there's no contention there. The data are saying what the data will say. If we, if we don't see evidence of that at a larger scale, so if we say, okay, we know that phosphorus becomes available through this mechanism at a really slow rate when the temperature is really low and the pH is really high, for example. So we go to a cold alkaline place and we see no evidence of phosphorus limitation. That doesn't mean that the lab work is wrong. It means that there's something else interacting that's creating this, this um, deviation from our prediction, right? And so this question, knowing how scale discrepancies are taken care of, it really gets at the heart of where things get interesting. We might anticipate, we might even hope to see evidence at a large scale that is just a linear extrapolation of what we see at a smaller scale. And sometimes that happens, but I've only heard of that. I've never actually observed that because life is really complicated. <laughs> um, and so where we see those scale discrepancies is really where it gets interesting, right? So what different is going on that's not going on on our lab bench? And that to me is where things get really exciting. So the question, the, the questioner is saying, how is that taken care of? And the answer is, it's, it only can be taken care of by highlighting those discrepancies and saying, ah, it is the shift from this scale to that scale where something else is interacting and causing this um, discrepancy. And that's where things really get interesting. Do it. Any of our other panelists wanna, wanna tackle this? Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer either. Um, but obviously from a geophysics standpoint, um, also the complication is that as you look at different scales, you're generally using different approaches so your your sampling volumes are also changing so obviously if you're collecting airborne data or you're collecting a you know a, a plot scale resistivity survey the the volume you're sampling with you know uh it's going to be very very different so then yeah how you deal with it i mean i don't know that's the kind of a million dollar question um but um probably yeah it is important to you know almost like 
start from large and then kind of try to narrow down. So try to get uh, a smaller, you know, resolution for, you know, um, for, a, for a, an area that you have a larger volume. So then you can kind of combine the different scales and try to, you know, understand that change at different scales and hopefully try to, you know, infer, uh, well, maybe, you know, based on your smaller variability, how, you know, that larger one might compare. But again, it's not, you know, there is no really uh, easy answer. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have an answer either. <laughs> Francis, I saw your face light up to something that he said, so I really would love to get your perspective now. Yeah, well, I think about um, this in terms of modeling and, and parameters that we choose for models. Um, and gosh, knowing what parameter to use in a model is unclear a lot of times. Um, and so one of the things that I've done a lot is kind of a feedback between um, modeling and field measurements. Um, and a, a good example might be um, recently after wildfires, um, we were really interested in how what the um, how fast water infiltrated into a watershed. And so we took a bunch of measurements and there was quite a bit of uncertainty in the measurements, but they tended to fall into a log normal distribution. And so we went, oh, okay, well we can um, use this kind of distribution of this thing that we measured to then model um, rainfall and runoff um, in a burned watershed. And we could just build that uncertainty from field measurements into our model. Um, and that was a, a pretty successful um, approach for our study. So Keeping in mind, um, it is now two o'clock, so I don't want to keep anybody past their obligations. Um, I do want to highlight that we will be back here um, same time next week um, for our final uh, installment in this cyber seminar series, um, where we are specifically going to be discussing how to um, broaden participation um, in the CZ community. Um, and I know that uh, Julia had something to close with as well um, out at Quasi. So I wanna make sure that I give her the opportunity to um, make the points that she needed to discuss. So if there are not any more questions or any more final points from our um, panelists, I will hand it over to Julia. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for all all of the panelists for sharing their research and experience um, with their critical zone research, and to our uh, hosts Nicole and Tam for facilitating everything. Uh, before you all go, uh, I just wanted to share some opportunities at Quasi that are coming up to add to the list of resources that the other pre presenters have shared. Um, Quasi is a nonprofit organization focusing on supporting the water science community. Uh, and in addition to these webinar series, we have uh, in person educational workshops and grant opportunities. Applications for a couple of our workshops are open now. The Community Wharf Hydro Training Workshop at NCAR in Colorado. Uh, the applications for that close February 28th. Um, Applications for the Precipitation Estimation and Analysis Using Remotely Sensed Information Workshop uh, at UC Irvine will close at the end of March. We have another webinar series, uh, another webinar happening a uh, week after the last one of this webinar with NSF Hydrologic Sciences. Um, and that will be an opportunity to talk to program managers and have questions answered uh, in a virtual town hall setting. So come with any questions you have about um, anything NSF hydrologic science related on March 18th. We also have applications open for our instrumentation discovery travel grant, which is one of the grants we offer at Quasi for graduate students and early career faculty to learn a new 
uh, methodology or instrumentation and, pro and it provides funding for training um, for that. Applications are open now and there's more information on our website. Finally, we have our own little um, conference, our biennial colloquium, which will be happening this July. It's a great opportunity to network with the water science community and learn more about what Quasi can offer. I would also encourage you to check out our website and sign up for our newsletter or contact me directly. My name is Julia and I'm the Science Education and Outreach Coordinator here at Quasi. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, definitely follow us on social media to get more information on upcoming events. And I hope that you can tune in next week for the fourth and final installment of this cyber seminar series. Um, and feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions or feedback. I would also be happy to pass on any question, remaining questions to our panelists today. So once again, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and posted on the Quasi website and YouTube channel. Um, and have a good rest of your day.